Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. This morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, open to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, resuming with verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. As customary, what I'm going to do is take us through the verse... I'm going to highlight some key words and key phrases, and I'm going to extrapolate some truths that are not seen in the English text by drawing from the Greek, explaining uh, the nuances that are there that are not clearly seen in the English text. Now, that doesn't mean that, that your English Bibles are no good. It just means that there are some things that are sometimes hidden that's not easily seen in the original text that will help us understand and get a the force of Paul's argument as we move through his book. So, resuming with verse 9, I'm also going to pull some, I'm going to pull at least three doctrines from the verse, verse 9, and then some practical implications for us, how that impacts us, and then show you how Jesus himself used 1 Corinthians Two nine in his own personal life. Okay, so I want you to appreciate the verses that we're going through, so that you can see how it relates to us as believers in Christ. It's one thing to say, okay, I know what verse nine is talking about, and I know First Corinthians one eighteen says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's what the power of God. So how does that impact us? How should that impact the believer in Christ? Well, it should impact us by recognizing that the Word of God, inherent in the Word of God, is power. So if you need power like I do, I don't know if anybody else needs power, it comes and is sourced from His Word. Bible doctrine has to be the mainstay here. So once you understand that, you habitually get into a routine of studying and getting into his word so that you come to church, you come to class on Wednesdays, you zoom in, you zoom out, and you understand that it's when I talk about man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, then you say, no wonder why Freddie keeps hammering that. Because Jesus said man shall not live by, by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, which is from Scripture. So, there is a reason to the madness. So, I want you to follow along with me. So, we're now looking at verse 9. So, the key words here is, As it is written, Kathos gen graftai is the word here, As it is written. So the importance of understanding and seeing this as it is written is that it, in, it indicates a completed action back then with ongoing relevance. So it's still relevant for us today. It's relevant for us as believers in Christ. So it applies to us, but think about this. As it is written. So we're going to see that not only did Paul write this, but we're going to see the significance of how Jesus used it as well. So what? As it is written. Big deal. So as it is written, what's the significance of it? Well, good. I'm glad you asked. We're going to see how Jesus used it in his life. And I know we've covered some of this in the past, but sometimes going over it, as Judy had mentioned last week, was it Judy or Debbie? Uh, review, 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 right? Going over it sometimes over and over and over, it helps us to solidify this in our mind's eye 
so that we are, when we're out there, we can say, aha, I got this. I know why this is important. So another thing worth pointing out, this is a t- it establishes the fact that this is a timely, it, it says timeless authority of the word of God. Bible doctrine is a timeless authority. So when Paul uses this, it's a completed action with ongoing relevance, establishing the timeless authority. So Paul anchors his teaching, listen to this, in prophetic tradition. Tradition, okay? Lending divine validation to Paul's message, his message. So that's important to know because as we move through this, you're going to see that there is a common theme in the one chapter. We're almost done with this chapter, by the way. So we're going to be able to finish this this year. (laughs) So this is excellent. I'm happy about that. So now we have Aftat Masuk Eden. I has not seen I has not seen. So when you actually break this apart or you parse it, in other words, this is what's called an aorist active indicative. It's third person singular. Eden is third person singular. Aftat mus ak Eden. Eden is the part that is third person singular. Now the significance here is that it's aorist tense highlighting a definitive past action in the past, in the back, 2,000 years ago. Emphasizing, listen to this, emphasizing human perceptions, limitation, and apprehending divine truths. So this is where it stops, ladies and gentlemen. This is why your friends, your family look at you and say, you're weird. It doesn't make sense. This does not make sense. I'd rather listen to Diddy's music. How about that? I'd rather listen to that. That makes better sense to me than, so what? You're sharing the word of God, and so what? Remember, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. Eye has not seen. So, aorist tense, highlighting a definitive past action. So, this emphasizes, listen, human perceptions limitation in apprehending divine truths. This sets the stage for the chapter's theme of spiritual wisdom. So we just stop here. I has not seen. What's next? What's next in the verse? Nor ear heard. Nor ear heard. Very good. So notice, I has not seen, but notice what precedes this. As it is written. So we're told up front, as it is written, as it is recorded, by the way, eye has not seen nor ear heard. Notice. Next up is Kaiux U Let's go take this slowly. Kaius Uk I Kudesen. I has nor ear heard. Kaius Uk I Kusen. So that's the words for nor ear heard. Is that important? Well, notice where Paul's going. So it's been said, it's been recorded. Eye has not seen, ear hasn't heard. So watch the significance here. Again, this is Eris active indicative, third person singular. The I kusin is third person singular. The importance of knowing this, what's all the big deal about this? Well, here's the big deal, ladies and gentlemen. It reinforces the idea that human faculties, not talking about school faculty, I'm talking about the ear gate, the eye gate. Human faculties cannot grasp divine mysteries. What's divine mysteries? This, ladies and gentlemen. How many of you have a Bible today? Every one of you should have a Bible. They cannot access or grasp divine mysteries that comes from the recorded word of God. What can't? The eye gate, the ear gate. So when you talk to them, when you show them the word of God, it cannot penetrate. It doesn't work. It does not come through loud and clear. So this reinforces the idea that human faculties 
cannot grasp divine mysteries, highlighting the need now for spiritual revelation. So how many of you, when talking to your family and friends, precede it with prayer? Something along the lines of, and you don't, it ha- doesn't have to be word for word, Father, you know, as I go speak to my family member, as I go speak to my friend, I pray that God the Holy Spirit would soften their heart so that when I share the gospel, they would be receptive. Ever do that? Because the eye gate, the ear gate, is imp- cannot and will not accept or respond to the things of God's divine truth. This is why it's foolishness. And we started in chapter 1. It's foolishness to those... What's another word for perishing, by the way? It's foolishness to those who are perishing. What's another word? Give me another powerful, explosive word for perishing. Dying. 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 The message of the cross... For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are dying... Think about that. It's ridiculous to those who are dying. Why? As it is written, as it is written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man. So don't think you're not trying hard enough. Don't think that you don't have, you haven't spent enough time in prayer. No. It is written that the human heart, the person is not receptive. They need help. They need something else that would help them understand what Paul is going to unpack here. So don't say it's your fault. Don't say you don't know enough. You know enough. How many of you are saved? How many of you have a personal relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ under the empowering ministry of God the Holy Spirit? It should be all of you. Those on Zoom land, those here in person, those who are listening to this post-recording, all should be saved by simple faith in Jesus Christ. So, if you can get saved, anybody else can get saved as well. But it has to be under the empowering ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. It has to be assisted by the Spirit of God. It can't be done and just accomplished on just willpower alone. But here's the thing, folks. What is required of, from you and me is to prioritize God. We have to prioritize God. God sees our efforts. He sees our actions. He sees our indifference. And so depending on how important things are to you will be dictated by how you prioritize God in your own personal life. So he sees that. The Holy Spirit sees that. God, the Son sees that. The triune God sees our actions. That's all I'm saying. So eye has not seen, ear has not heard. So let's now move on to the next key words here. Next words. Nor have entered into the heart of man. Look at that. Nor have entered into the heart of man. Cardion anthropu uk en eve. In other words, have not entered into the heart of man. What has it? Well, it's been written. It's been written that these things, the spiritual truths of the Apostle Paul, has not been able to enter into the heart of man. Nor have entered into the heart of man. Eris active indicative, third person singular. On eve is third person singular. The importance of this is the heart. We all have a heart, right? Symbolizes, when, we, when you see the word heart here, it's not the pulsating vein or the blood that's in your left side of your chest or in the middle. Not talking about that. It symbolizes understanding and intention. This phrase underscores the necessity of divine revelation beyond human comprehension. Beyond human comprehension. So now the last phrase here. Let's pick this apart. Prepared for those who love him. Ah, 
Now there's a contrast. God is prepared for those who love him. So you've got the as it is written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who what? So there's a second group. Those who love him. This prepared for those who love him is eras active indicative, third person singular. Hey, toy, masin is third person singular. And so the highlight or the importance or significance of this is the following. This highlights God's intentional preparation of blessings. How many of you want blessings? Well, he's prepared it. Prepare preparation of blessings for believers. Are you all a believer here? You on Zoom land, you in, per, in person? He's prepared those who love him. So those who love him, blessings are forthcoming. You know, it's kind of like this. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 2. I grew up in the 80s. Some have called this the old school days. In the 80s, I would never have thought that this here would have what it currently has. The power to search information at the touch of a button. Enter. You want to look something up in Google? Fraction of a second. What's this word mean? Look up a passage in scripture. Touch of a button. Would you call that a blessing? Yes. You can find anything on the internet. You could go to school via the internet. That is a blessing. There, yes, it's true that it could be used for evil. It could be used negatively. It could be a problem for some. But in general, it is a blessing if you use it as such. So 1 Corinthians 2.9, God is preparing a blessing for us. I has not seen, I wouldn't have known this in the 80s, I'm sitting there carrying a boom box back then. Remember those boom box? You sit there and go see who has the loudest boom box. It would be a standoff between the hard rockers over there and the funk and soul over here. You turn, turn your, your stereo up and you just crank it up until you can't stand it anymore. And you walk by and, and people would walk by, their ears, they put their hand like this and you could say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't even remember the term, but we're blasting them out or something. Again, this is in the 80s, okay? <clears throat> I don't do that anymore. But we would challenge each other, and we would have a blast. But if you told me that there would be a blessing in the future, that, you know, you don't even have to worry about a boombox anymore, you could search this up on your, in the palm of your hand, and you could do far more in your hand by just a little box, a little square box with glass, and you can hear any song you want at the touch of a button, and that would be in the future for us. And I would say, you're crazy. And then to on top of that, Scott, check this out, you'd be able to control the devices in your home by just the tap of a button. Yeah, that's right. You can turn your lights on. You can turn your lights off. You can check the temperature of your home. Huh? Can you guys do that? I can't. And all in the palm of your hand. That is 1 Corinthians 2.9, ladies and gentlemen. Let's, let, let, let's read that now and overlay it here. But it is written, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man, but the things which God has prepared for those who love him. There's something forthcoming for those who love God. There's a blessing that's coming for those who love God. It's not going to be just for anybody. It's contingent upon those who love God. Those who are believers. Prepared for those who love God. It highlights God's intentional preparation of blessing for the believer. 
emphasizing the role of a loving relationship with God in receiving these gifts. Wow. Fantabulous. Is that a word? <coughs> Fantastic. It's amazing. That's for us who are believers. For those who love God. It's all tucked in the one verse. Now, <clears throat> I want to share something now. I want to take a moment to talk about as it is written. The phrase that is, as it is written is significant both for Paul, because he uses it here, and in Jesus' life during his encounter with Satan in Matthew chapter 4. This phrase carries with it profound implications for understanding the authority of Scripture and its role in the lives of the believer. So let's explore the significance. First of all, the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.9 uses it here. He emphasizes the divine authority and reliability of Scripture. This phrase grounds his teaching in the prophetic tradition, asserting that the truth he discusses are not his own inventions, but are rooted in God's revealed word. It underscores the idea that spiritual wisdom and understanding come from God revealed through Scripture. So now I'm going to do something slightly different and the men know exactly what I'm talking. So in Matthew chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to do something slightly different. <clears throat> in Matthew 4, in each of Jesus' response to Satan... This is what he says in Matthew 4.4. 4. Who has Matthew 4.4? 4? I think that is Paul. Yep. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Very good. And then he says in verse 7, Who has verse 7? Go ahead, uh, Sam. Very good. And then Samson, let's, let's I mean, uh, Travis, give your, um, your acting skills. Then Jesus said to them, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Okay, very good. So the idea here is Satan, uh, Jesus, in three instances, use the as it is written. He used as is it written, demonstrating his reliance on Scripture as the ultimate authority. This highlights the sufficiency of God's word in what? In combating temptation. In guiding moral and spiritual decisions. Jesus' use of Scripture shows that even he, God the Son, second person of the Trinity, submits to the authority of God's Word, providing a model for us as believers. So, second point regarding as it is written. It is a defense against temptation and error. So, in the context of Paul in, in 2.9 here, Paul is addressing the Corinthians' tendency to rely on human wisdom and philosophy. By anchoring his message in Scripture, he defends against the error of elevating human understanding above divine revelation. This teaches believers that God's wisdom, as revealed in Scripture, is superior to human knowledge. Does that make sense? It's superior to human knowledge. Remember, he's talking to those in the Corinthian church who was exposed to all the rhetoric and the, all the, the, uh, the debating tactics that was very fam common during this time. So Paul was squashing all that. So now in the context of Jesus, during the temptation in the wilderness, Jesus uses scripture as his defense against Satan's attacks. So God himself, God the Son, Use the Word of God, and this demonstrates the power of God's Word, Bible doctrine. 
to expose and con- counteract the falsehoods and temptations that do come our way. It encourages us to equip ourselves with God's word as a means of spiritual defense. So the third point, it talks about the continuity and fulfillment found in God's word. In other words, look at in what Paul's use by saying right there on the top, it is written, Paul connects his teaching to the continuity of God's revelation throughout history. It shows that the truths of the gospel are the fulfillment of what was prophesied back in the scriptures. As far as Jesus, his use, Jesus' citations of scripture during his temptation emphasize the fulfillment of God's promises and his faithfulness to his word. It shows that Jesus in the embodiment of the law and the prophets fulfilling what was written. So, the phrase as it is written serves as a powerful reminder of the authority and reliability of Bible doctrine, Scripture. In both Paul's writings and Jesus' temptation, it underscores the need for us as believers to ground our lives in God's Word, using it as a guide and defense against the challenges and deceptions we often face. By doing so, we can draw strength and wisdom from the eternal truths revealed by God himself. So, now I want to show you some doctrines that are found in verse 9. There are three of them. Number one, the doctrine of progressive revelation. Spiritual truths are revealed by God, not discovered through human effort, contrasting worldly and spiritual wisdom. So progressive revelation as seen as it is written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man. So I see progressive revelation through the Word of God, especially as seen in the New Testament. We sometimes hear in doctrinal circles the mysteries of God. This is also anchored in the mysteries of God. Progressive revelation is doctrine number one. Doctrine number two is doctrine of God's sovereignty. His sovereignty because of the fact that God is prepared for those who love him. So God meticulously prepares blessings for believers, that's you and I, reflecting his sovereign care and providence. Are you going through hardship? He's preparing something for you. Just a matter of time. He's preparing something for you. Kind of like the illustration I used with the cell phone. Who would ever know that we would have the blessing of what we currently have today? So doctrine of sovereignty, number one, we saw was the progressive revelation. Number two is sovereignty. Number three is fellowship with God. What do I mean? Well, fellowship with God is essential for receiving divine revelations underscoring God's importance in fellowship. You and I should prioritize that. We should have fellowship with God, and we do that and we rectify any sin in our lives through the use of 1 John 1, 9. That is so key and very important. We don't easily have fellowship just because we're a child of God. We have to make sure we're in good terms with Him. We're always going to be a son, always going to be a daughter, but the grieving and the quenching of the Spirit is something that happens on on a regular basis as a result of sin. So doctrine of fellowship with God, that's something that comes out loud and clear in the New Testament. So fellowship with God, two is spiritual wisdom, um, God's sovereignty and progressive revelation. So now, some practical implications, there are three. Number one, seek spiritual wisdom. Engage in prayer and study to pursue spiritual wisdom. You can't get wisdom apart from God's Word. You must study the Word of God. 
It has to be a habit. It has to be consistent on a regular basis. Engage in prayer. Pursue wisdom only through Bible doctrine. Trust in God to reveal his truth to those who seek him earnestly. So you seek him earnestly, he will reveal the truths as found in his word. How do we know this? Because he's our comforter. He is the one who guides us into all truth. And one of the ministries of God, the Holy Spirit, is to illuminate the truth of God's word, which is why the natural man find, finds it foolishness. We're going to see that in the rest of chapter 2, that it's the Spirit of God who illuminates and sheds understanding in God's truth as we get there. So right now we're in verse 9. So seek spiritual wisdom, number one. Number two, trust in God's goodness. In a, in a day and age, in our culture where things are topsy-turvy and it doesn't make sense, anchor yourself in God's truth. That's the only thing that we can trust. That's the only person that we can have stability from. That's the only way that we can have comfort during this day and age. Nothing else. So trust in God's goodness. Recognize that God has prepared good things for those who love him, as per 2.9. Nurturing deep trust in his benevolent plans. Number three, promote fellowship with God. Prioritize loving God. Recognizing that love is key to experiencing his prepared blessings, as per 2.9 in 1 Corinthians. So... Promote fellowship with God. Advance the fellowship around His Word. Very, very important. We sometimes take for granted, oh, I'm a child of God. No, don't just say that. It's kind of like your child. Oh, I'm just a son, daughter, so I'm God. My parents are going to take care of me. Yes, that's true, but there's rapport that comes with fellowship. So likewise, make sure that you're in fellowship with God Himself. Exercise 1 John 1, 9 and prioritize His Word. So having said that, I'd like us to look at John 14, 2 to 3. I have it here in the box. But if you have your Bibles, it would be good to follow along. How did Jesus use this? How did Jesus apply 1 Corinthians 2, 9 in his life? Well, in John 14, this is how, what I see. This is why it's important to look closely at the word, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Otherwise, we'll just look at this and say, oh, what a wonderful passage about Jesus going to the Father. Yes, that's true, but notice how I'm kind of paralleling this with 1 Corinthians 2.9. So the example from the life of Christ, he illustrates the truth of 1 Corinthians by speaking about divine preparation. He says the following, In my Father's house are what? Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Isn't that fantastic? That's called divine preparation. For who? For you. For me. For those who are believers in Christ. Is that good news? Yes. How many times have you read this? Once? Twice? Three, three times? Four times? Now look at this as the application of 1 Corinthians 2.9 from the God the Son himself. For you and for me. This is what God has prepared for those who love him. Fantastic. Fantastic. So explanation. Jesus reassures his disciples about their future. Reflecting God's prepared blessings for those who love him. That's you and I, folks. That's you and I. So this, we ended on time. Isn't that fantastic? What a blessing. I thought I would do a blessing for all of us, too. We ended on time. So, please notice the things which God has prepared for you who love Him. How many of you love Him? He's got something stored up for you. Don't lose hope. Don't be discouraged. Bible doctrine is where it's at. God's Word is where it's at. The more that you sink yourself and root yourself in God's Word, 
the more you're going to be stable, the more you're going to be able to face the challenges that will come our way. Rather than say, I can't listen to James, count it all joy when you encounter trials and tribulations, I'd rather listen to what Jesus said. Count it all joy? That's hard. How are you going to count it all joy when you're going through hardship? It is hard. But when you collectively pull what the other passage of Scripture says, and then you look at how Jesus applied it in his own life, it becomes bearable. And to know that you are the recipient of the blessing that's forthcoming, ladies and gentlemen, you have hope. You have a blessing just around the horizon. So let's close in a word of prayer and give him the honor and glory that rightfully belongs to him. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time that we can assemble together and to be reminded of how one simple verse like this has so much for us that we can look at it closely and see how Jesus himself had applied it in his life so that we can recognize that there is a spiritual gem here in verse 9. Sometimes, I would say, often overlooked. And so when you look at the commentaries on verse 9 of 1 Corinthians, there's a lot of things that come out. But Father, I hope and trust that you are pleased with the extrapolation that I invested as I prepared for this study so that I can expose it to your church, those who are believers in Christ, whether on Zoom land or post-recording or here face-to-face at NCBC. I am grateful and I'm honored to be able to stand with the royal family of God so that we can advance the cause of Christ and we can uphold Bible doctrine on a consistent basis amidst a myriad of churches that have failed and let you down. We're seeing such a dilemma now and it isn't if the churches do not rally around your word and prioritize Bible doctrine, Father, we're going to continue to tank and we're going to see this moral degeneracy unless the churches come together and put both feet down and say Bible doctrine is the way to go. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to stand along with the brothers, brethren here in NCBC. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.